Thanks, Beth, and, and thanks, Columbia, for having me. I'm, I'm really excited and, and confused and struggling and trying to figure out my own path forward over my whole life. And I think that's a part of what I think all of us are facing at different times. And, uh, and so I'm going to share with you just the part of the journey and uh, a bit of discovery. Um, so I think I've been trying to understand what is happening with many of the things that Beth just said. You know, what are we entering right now? What is this new age? And then what is the place that we have in this age? And, and so I want to talk about this idea of a playlist for our future. How, how might we think about this? I think of it as, and from my studies and research, kind of a jazz age of cognition. I think we're entering a new age where we're going to actually have to be improvisational with these machines that are maybe not made of, made of organic matter, um, the, the human to, human to silicon uh, players. Um, and, and if we look back in history, it's kind of interesting. Every time we have created some new technology, whether it was the wheel or fire or uh, the Jacquard loom in the 1800s or something, we've actually seen this interesting rise in economics, uh, output, jobs, right from the Industrial Revolution to World War II to the GI Bill enabling an entire another generation for the information and computing revolution. And, and I feel like it's a little scary because I think we're right here in this valley. And, and when you're in a valley looking up, it's a little scary because uh, you're like, oh, no, what's happening? And, um, and, and in fact, we're always shocked, even though we are the creators of the technology. Humans are, by definition, makers and creative. But each time we do it, we're shocked. And I think right there, um, we're, we've hit these sh tech shocks before. We've figured them out. Right there, we're at a moment of this new age of cognition or automation. Um, and you know, when you're in the valley, a lot of times sorcerers come out and, and just predict magic will happen will live forever, life will be great. And also prophets come out and they profess the end of life on Earth. Uh, you know, they sort of uh, profess doom. Um, but I'm not sure that that's how humanity works. We kind of muddle through. We, we figure things out and we're pretty creative. Um, and passion and some of those other things that Beth showed turn out to be way more important than we think. We, we always discount human, human passion and creativity. Um, and I don't think it's the age only of um, cognition where, we, where you, you might have thought I was just talking about like silicon cognition or machine learning and, and AI and all that. It's actually, I think, the dawning age of human cognition in that we have had more research papers published and more interesting things happening in neuroscience and cognitive psychology than I've ever seen in the last 100 or 200 years. There are new things because we're getting out of the lab and getting into context. We can put IoT devices on people and get out in the world and learn. And we're starting to discover some fascinating new work. Um, so I think it's also the dawning age of human cognition, both in groups, uh, behavioral economics, and other aspects of the social science, but also individually and in how we're motivated, how we move from self-doubt to agency, how we actually reboot ourselves in new times. So I think we should think of this as kind of almost like a, a, a new kind of jazz band or a new kind of team. where We've got some learners that happen to be organic on the team. That's us. Um, and, and some that are maybe silicon that are machine learners, and we're in a new team. We're going to have to manage that new team, and managers, middle managers, are probably going to be ha having to face you know, algorithms got, that got tra bad training data the same way that um, when I sent my kid off to college, he went to a fraternity. That was bad training data. Um, <laughs> you know, and, 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 uh, so I think we're going to be facing this weird thing where, where we've got to have to manage the strengths and weaknesses of both. And if we look at this, um, Beth mentioned a, a whole bunch of things, and, and they aggregate into some interesting places, like passion. Um, humans actually can't help themselves. That's a better way to think of passion. How many people have ever been to like an antique flea market? Or flea market? Just walk that place. People can't help themselves. It's full of stuff. You might not think it's wonderful stuff. I like collecting mid-century kind of chrome things. I don't know why. I'm, I love shiny objects, but it's amazing. And what you realize is people can't help themselves. Jacquard makes this loom. It, it commoditizes manufacturing for fabrics in the 1800s. Pretty soon you find out this guy Babbage and Lady Ada, the first programmer, Lord Byron's daughter, have a selfie made of 24,000 cards that was made on the Jacquard loom of Jacquard. So like one manufacturing technology suddenly inspired an entire new revolution called the computing revolution. Babbage was one of the earlier and Lady Ada was the first coder of developers of this, this space. So we have passion. Now, um, we also have common sense. And you can find no AI system on the planet that has common sense, innateness, a mental model, or any kind of thing at all. You can find $100 million prizes for anybody that can do it. Nobody can do it because a human, a squirrel, a dog, a dolphin, we all have a mental model in our head of the world. 
and we accrete it over time. We call it wisdom. Um, but this, this idea of common sense is discounted. Uh, because we see it all the time, we expect the machines to have it too when we see a robot dog. It doesn't. So it means it's very brittle. You can put a little sticker on the side of any stop sign in Silicon Valley. It's called an adversarial patch. And every self-driving car will drive right past the stop sign because it's confused by a little dazzle pattern. It thinks maybe you just put a big toaster on the side of the road. So, so there are things that we accrete because we have an R&D lab that's three billion years old that we don't have yet in the machine learners. Um, but we do have common sense and passion. We've got creativity and prediction. Now, the machine learners, I put some big lines there, they're commoditizing prediction. They're commoditizing creativity, actually, with something called generative adversarial networks. You've started to see things like deep fake, where people are starting to be able to put people together and mash them up. It's like a web search for things that don't exist. So it's a little scary in some ways. And commoditizing prediction means you can do things we could never do before, like predict where a car's going to pull out so we can have a self-driving car react. So it's actually creating entire new markets. But I mentioned that machines don't have common sense. They also don't have passion, at least not yet. Uh, they don't have their own agency. Somebody writes that in. They also have a lot of biases. Um, they say that if you use something called deep learning, um, it's a great way to repeat the past. Because if you, if you use that as the training data, and it says, like, we don't pay women as much as men or whatever, and we've got 30 years of training data, deep learning suggests keep paying women less. So we have to be aware of the biases that are both human biases. We've got, you know, I think 192 or 200 documented biases humans have, which are shortcuts, but they sometimes are past their sell-by date. Um, and then machines actually can amplify those at very big rates. So we have to be very careful. There's some beautiful work around algorithmic bias um, going on right now by Sophia Noble and some other researchers. How do we create uh, sort of algorithmic justice leagues? Um, so we have to be aware of those things, but how do we balance together? And I think that's what gets kind of exciting. Um, uh, we need to have diverse teams. Beth talked about that, and she was pushing pretty hard on that for most of her life. How do you get more diversity? But not just gender diversity or cultural diversity. We're going to have diverse teams of algorithms and humans and how they play together and different kinds of humans playing together. So the space I've been exploring is called generativity. It's a, it's a really old pattern. It's a design pattern I wrote about in Trillions that is as old as life on Earth. Um, it's a trick, but it's a design pattern of process, not form. Um, so here's a simple generative pattern. You just define two dimensions, like what's on the inside of a snack and what's on the outside of a snack, and it suddenly generates a whole bunch of possibilities. Um, you get chocolate, chocolate, that could be okay. Chocolate peanut butter, boom, I just invented Reese's peanut butter cups. Chocolate hot peppers, that's my own chocolate. So just by defining two dimensions of the problem, sort of problem definition, I get this expansion. It's almost like Mendel's Peapod experiments. I get lots of things. Um, you can do the same thing with shapes. When I was early, an early product designer, you learned that just by defining where you cut something along the top and where you bend something along the side, you get this explosion of possibilities. So it's actually kind of an algorithm. Think of genetic, uh, genetic networks and things. So we decided to do some experiments at Autodesk about this, because we make products that, that help people make things, the physical world. We said, what if you could just define the goals, the dimensions, the constraints, and let the machine play with those so that you could have a partner? So this is what it looks like if you're designing a skateboard truck. You take these arrows and you put them around where you know there are newtons of forces. So you could say there's like 52 newtons of forces here or 5,000 here. And you drag those arrows around and then you say don't grow here where the red is. Those are obstacles. So you define your goals, you define your constraints. I need to tilt the skateboard truck. And you hit a button and it generates thousands of possibilities and you checkbox which ones you want to manufacture. Do you want them to be a hybrid manufactured, additive, subtractive, cast, or composite? And it automatically generates things at the same level of resolution that are manufacturable. We started playing with the same idea for buildings. What if you could actually say the homeowner cares about backyard size and views and solar gain, the contractor cares about cost and profit, the city cares about variety and program and code, and then you only focus on defining the goals and constraints and generate thousands of possibilities. This was a group called Van Wynen in the Netherlands. They wanted to build net zero homes, and they have very thin margins, contractors in general building things, but they actually cared about profit and cost and net zero, so they actually gave the homeowners controls over some of the sliders and the city over some others. And then they went out there and started actually looking at the optimization across multiple dimensions, which humans are not so great at sometimes. And we ended up having these homes built in about three days each. They're net zero, and the entire communities are now being popped up. This is about two years ago. So it gives you this sense that if we could employ generativity, we could play with the machines. And the designers and architects who've used these first said, oh, no. 
Uh, I know what happens when you raise new machine interns. They just like real interns. They they grow up and start their own studios. They take your job. But what they found was because the machines had no common sense, they would explore big places. But it was but it was their ability to actually play with the goals and adjust the goals. They felt they actually started describing it as punk, as jazz. They were messing around and they were getting pushed by an algorithm somewhere and they were playing back. It wasn't a static experience at all. So we're entering this age of cognition. But I also think we need to be thinking about what if we could apply generative design, this generativity idea, to learning itself. At BCG, we released a report recently about how organizations and communities are going to win in the 20s. And one of the top three things we said was we have to actually compete on the rate of learning. We have to close autonomous learning loops between humans and machines. And, and that's the kind of thing I've been focusing on. So this, this internal report was about competing on the rate of learning. So I said, what if we were to apply generative design to learning itself? That was the idea. And um, if you think about traditional education, you go kind of K through 12, you get a degree, you get a certification, you learn a bunch, and then you supposedly apply that your whole life. It's a very if-this-then process. Carnegie Credits model is more than 100 years old, effectively. Um, but what if that doesn't work for a world where more, more cognition matters? What if that doesn't work? And so we asked this question. And I did a little experiment. I said, here's a product design tool. Um, it's called Fusion. Uh, uh, it's just for designing products. What if first we could instrument the heck out of it using sensors and understand what your actual knowledge was? So in this case, you're designing maybe a pair of headphones. As you're working, you're lofting things. You're extruding things. You're replicating and duplicating and mirroring things. And the system dynamically says, whoa, I think you just demonstrated some pretty cool skills. You never checked the tutorial. You explored the things. Bill, you're doing OK. You've actually demonstrated some things. So this is about performance. Becomes your certification. I never test the person. This is called dynamic formative assessment. Every moment, I can kind of see where they're close, where their proximal learning is. Um, you haven't actually demonstrated anything in simulation, cam, or patching. Um, or maybe I could like, let you see other people who know how to do this, or other tutorials that have been built by your peers, um, and be able to kind of explore who knows it, how can they do it, automatically tell them commands they can learn next based on their goals. So now look at a resume and try to figure out who you want to hire. Do you want to hire Tina? Do you want to hire Bill? I just showed Bill. Do you want to hire someone else? It's very hard to tell. If we zoom in, we can go, oh, OK, I'm a product designer, so I want to hire some people with AutoCAD or SolidWorks. Oh, they've got AutoCAD and SolidWorks. Wait, they do too. They've got Creo. Um, if you look at AutoCAD, it has 14,000 or 1,400, 1,500 commands. Which ones do they know? Everybody puts that they know something, but I can't tell. And I can't really use any of the current ways of matching skills to what I need. But if we're not going to drive the future by, by kind of learning from people, we're not going to ever know. So here's Tina again, but this time I can wind back and actually see what she really did, and I can see her goals. Six months, she wants to get better at generative design. She wants to practice leadership. She wants to teach a class on improvisational leadership. Um, in 12 months, she has other goals. And she can come back and say, well, but I want to work at a company that's going to grow me. So company A, show me your project leaders. How fast are they growing, and will they grow me in places I want to grow? Company B, show me yours. So this is a war for talent. We've got something in the order of 30 to 40% of the baby boom workforce is retiring in the next five years. And people like GM and others are saying they have nobody to hire. So there are big challenges here where we're having a, a sort of resource matching problem. So we're going to have to compete on the rate of learning. So imagine Tina's here. And she's got these goals. You can actually see her map of kind of what she's already been able to demonstrate. Um, she hires Mike. Mike actually has some goals. Now, let's take a look at those goals that Mike has, because mentoring is a powerful way of teaching. It's called the mentor effect. So let's see. She wants to hone her skills, and he wants to actually learn generative design skills. So let's match them up dynamically and actually watch what happens. This is, this is real data from designers at Volkswagen designing a generatively designed wheel for their new electric van. And you can actually see over time, she's really good at generative. He's really good at, at part modeling. She's doing the sculpting. He's doing this other stuff. But look, he's growing in generativity because they're sort of teaching each other. It's tag team. It, but it's actually a three-way jazz because the machine is helping figure out where the proximal goals are, where you can leap, leap over them and have leveling up moments, and you can get a feeling for that. So that's the idea behind what we're doing. It's really way, way, way wide open still. Um, we don't know what we don't know yet. Um, but imagine the learner's journey now is that as they set their goals, oops, the system, let's go back one, as they learn their goals, the system says, whoa, that was, that was okay, we learned a skill, 
And behind the scenes, it's starting to look for other skills. It's starting to do that prediction stuff that it can do. Maybe it says, you know, if you've got that skill, it opens up five jobs. And then they actually go work at a place and learn a new tool, and it says, whoa, you worked at that team or that place. It starts to look for patterns a human might not see, that these three things snap together and open up five more possibilities. So what would happen if this thing were kind of, as it was going, it was learning about how you were learning? And it was basically your own n equals one partner in your journey. You could almost simulate future you. And that's really the, the promise here. Is I can't even predict how many things you made as little tutorials for people that suddenly snap into this new mindset called human-centered design and predicted new jobs we don't even know the name of yet. So that's the kind of vision for this. And, and I guess it boils down to, could we give people personal playlists for the future? Could we, could we break away from the kind of classic models and say lifelong learning? Till the day I die, I'm going to be growing my brain, and I'm going to be moving upwardly mobile. And I think that's the kind of dream for this. Thank you. Great.